Hello and welcome to The Northern Narrator, where I read science fiction and fantasy novels so you can listen wherever and whenever you are. Now, please enjoy part one of Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. Chapter one. Third. I've watched through his eyes, I've listened through his ears, and I tell you, he's the one. Or at least, as close as we're going to get. That's what you said about his brother. The brother tested out impossible for other reasons, nothing to do with his ability. Same with the sister, and there are doubts about him. He's too malleable, too willing to submerge himself to someone else's will. Not if the other person is his enemy. So what do we do? Surround him with enemies all the time? If we have to. I thought you said you liked this kid. If the buggers get him, they'll make me look like his favorite uncle. All right, we're saving the world after all. Take him. The monitor lady smiled very nicely and tousled his hair and said, Andrew, I suppose by now you're just absolutely sick of having that horrid monitor. Well, I have good news for you. The monitor is going to come out today. We're going to take it right out and it won't hurt a bit. Ender nodded. It was a lie, of course, that it wouldn't hurt a bit. But since adults always said it when it was going to hurt, he could count on that statement as an accurate prediction of the future. Sometimes lies were more dependable than the truth. So, if you'll just come over here, Andrew, just sit right up here on the examining table. The doctor will be in to see you in a moment. The monitor gone. Ender tried to imagine the little device missing from the back of his neck. I'll roll over on my back in bed, and it won't be pressing there. I won't feel it tingling and taking up the heat when I shower. And Peter won't hate me anymore. I'll come home and show him that the monitor's gone and he'll see that I didn't make it either, that I'll just be a normal kid now, like him. That won't be so bad then. He'll forgive me that I had my monitor a whole year longer than he had his. We'll be... not friends, probably. No, Peter was too dangerous. Peter got so angry. Brothers, though. Not enemies, not friends, but brothers. Able to live in the same house. He won't hate me. He'll just leave me alone. And when he wants to play buggers and astronauts... Maybe I won't have to play. Maybe I can just go read a book. But Ender knew, even as he thought it, that Peter wouldn't leave him alone. There was something in Peter's eyes when he was in his bad mood. And whenever Ender saw that look, that glint, he knew that the one thing Peter would not do was leave him alone. I'm practicing piano, Ender. Come turn the pages for me. Oh, is the monitor boy too busy to help his brother? Is he too smart? Got to go kill some buggers, astronaut? No, no, I don't want your help. I can do it on my own, you little bastard, you little third. This won't take long, Andrew, said the doctor. Ender nodded. It's designed to be removed, without infection, without damage. But there'll be some tickling, and some people say they have a feeling of something missing. You'll keep looking around for something, something you were looking for, but you can't find it, and you can't remember what it was. So I'll tell you. It's the monitor you're looking for, and it isn't there. In a few days, that feeling will pass. The doctor was twisting something into the back of Ender's head. Suddenly, a pain stabbed through him like a needle from the neck to the groin. Ender felt his back spasm, and his body arched violently backward. His head struck the bed. He could feel his legs thrashing, and his hands were clenching each other, wringing each other so tightly that they ached. Dee Dee, shouted the doctor. I need you. The nurse ran in, gasped. Gotta relax these muscles. Get it to me now. What are you waiting for? Something changed hands. Ender could not see. He lurched to one side and fell off the examining table. Catch him, cried the nurse. Just hold him steady. You hold him, doctor. He's too strong for me. Not the whole thing. You'll stop his heart. Ender felt a needle enter his back, just above the neck of his shirt. It burned, but wherever in him the fire spread, his muscles gradually unclenched. Now he could cry for the fear and pain of it. Are you all, are you all right, Andrew? the nurse asked. Andrew could not remember how to speak. They lifted him onto the table. They checked his pulse, did other things. He did not understand it at all. The doctor was trembling. His voice shook as he spoke. They leave these things in the kids for three years. What do they expect? We could have switched him off. Do you realize that? We could have unplugged his brain for all time. When do the drugs wear off? Asked the nurse. Keep him here for at least an hour. Watch him. 
If he doesn't start talking in 15 minutes, call me. Could have unplugged him forever. I don't have the brains of a bugger. He got back to Miss Pumphrey's class only 15 minutes before the closing bell. He was still a little unsteady on his feet. Are you all right, Andrew? asked Miss Pumphrey. He nodded. Were you ill? He shook his head. You don't look well. I'm okay. You'd better sit down, Andrew. He started toward his seat, but stopped. Now, what was I looking for? I can't think what I was looking for. Your seat is over there, said Miss Pumphrey. He sat down, but it was something else he needed, something he had lost. I'll find it later. Your monitor, whispered the girl behind him. Andrew shrugged. His monitor, which she whispered to the other students. Andrew reached up and felt his neck. There was a band-aid. It was gone. He was just like everybody else now. Washed out, Andy, asked a boy who sat across the aisle and behind him. Couldn't think of his name. Peter. No, that was someone else. Quiet, Mr. Stilson, said Miss Pumphrey. Stilson smirked. Miss Pumphrey talked about multiplication. Ender doodled on his desk, drawing contour maps of mountainous islands, and then telling his desk to display them in three dimensions from every angle. The teacher would know, of course, that he wasn't paying attention, but she wouldn't bother him. He always knew the answer, even when she thought he wasn't paying attention. In the corner of his desk, a word appeared and began marching around the perimeter of the desk. It was upside down and backward at first, but Ender knew what it said long before it reached the bottom of his desk and turned right side up. Third. Ender smiled. He was the one who had figured out how to send messages and make them march. Even as his secret enemy called him names, the method of delivery praised him. It was not his fault that he was a third. It was the government's idea. They were the ones who authorized it. How else could a third like Ender have got into school? And now the monitor was gone. The experiment entitled Andrew Wigan hadn't worked out after all. If they could, he was sure they would like to rescind the waivers that had allowed him to be born at all. Didn't work, so erase the experiment. The bell rang. Everybody signed off their desks or hurriedly typed in reminders to themselves. Some were dumping lessons or data onto their computers at home. A few gathered at the printers while something they wanted to show was printed out. Ender spread his hands over the child-sized keyboard near the edge of the desk and wondered what it would feel like to have hands as large as a grown-up's. They must feel so big and awkward, thick, stubby fingers and beefy palms. Of course, they had bigger keyboards. But how could their thick fingers draw a fine line the way Ender could, a thin line so precise that he could make it spiral 79 times from center to the edge of the desk without the line ever touching or overlapping? It gave him something to do while the teacher droned on about arithmetic. Arithmetic! Valentine had taught him arithmetic when he was three. Are you all right, Andrew? Yes, ma'am. You'll miss the bus. Ender nodded and got up. The other kids were gone. They would be waiting, though, the bad ones. His monitor wasn't perched on his neck. Hearing what he heard and seeing what he saw, they could say what they liked. They might even hit him now. No one could see them anymore, and so no one would come to Ender's rescue. There were advantages to the monitor, and he would miss them. It was Stilson, of course. He wasn't bigger than most other kids, but he was bigger than Ender, and he had some others with him. He always did. Hey, third! Don't answer. Nothing to say. Hey, third! We're talking to you! Third! Hey, bugger lover! We're talking to you! Can't think of anything to answer. Anything I say will make it worse, so we'll say nothing. Hey, third! Hey, turd! You flunked out, huh? Thought you were better than us, but you lost your little birdie. Thirty got a band-aid on your neck. Are you going to let me through? Ender asked. Are we going to let him through? Should we let him through? They all laughed. Sure, we'll let you through. First, we'll let your arm through. Then your butt through. Then maybe a piece of your knee. The others chimed in now. Lost your birdie, thirty. Lost your birdie, thirty. Stilson began pushing him with one hand. Someone behind him then pushed him towards Stilson. See saw Marjorie Da, somebody said. Tennis, ping pong. This would not have a happy ending, so Ender decided that he'd rather not be the unhappiest at the end. The next time Stilson's arm came out to push him, Ender grabbed at it. He missed. Oh, gonna fight me, huh? Gonna fight me, thirty? The people behind Ender grabbed at him to hold him. Ender did not feel like laughing, but he laughed. 
You mean it takes this many to fight one third? We're people, not thirds, turd face. You're about as strong as a fart. But they let him go, and as soon as they did, Ender kicked out high and hard, catching Stilson square in the breastbone. He dropped. It took Ender by surprise. He hadn't thought to put Stilson on the ground with one kick. It didn't occur to him that Stilson didn't take a fight like this seriously, but he wasn't prepared for a truly desperate blow. For a moment, the others backed away and Stilson lay motionless. They were all wondering if he was dead. Ender, however, was trying to figure out a way to forestall vengeance, to keep them from taking him in a pack tomorrow. I have to win this now, and for all time, or I'll fight it every day, and it will get worse and worse. Ender knew the unspoken rules of manly warfare, even though he was only six. It was forbidden to strike the opponent who lay helpless on the ground. Only an animal would do that. So, Ender walked to Stilson's supine body and kicked him again, viciously, in the ribs. Stilson groaned and rolled away from him. Ender walked around him and kicked him again in the crotch. Stilson could not make a sound. He only doubled up and tears streamed out of his eyes. Then, Ender looked at the others coldly. You might be having some idea of ganging up on me. You could probably beat me up pretty bad, but just remember what I do to people who try to hurt me. From then on, you'd be wondering when I'd get you and how bad it would be. He kicked Stilson in the face. Blood from his nose spattered on the ground nearby. It wouldn't be this bad, Ender said. It would be worse. He turned and walked away. Nobody followed him. He turned a corner into the corridor leading to the bus stop. He could hear the boys behind him saying, Jeez, look at him, he's wasted. Ender leaned his head against the wall of the corridor and cried until the bus came. I am just like Peter. Take my monitor away, and I am just like Peter. Chapter 2. Peter. All right, it's off. How's he doing? You live inside somebody's body for a few years. You get used to it. I look at his face now. I can't tell what's going on. I'm not used to seeing his facial expressions. I'm used to feeling them. Come on, we're not talking about psychoanalysts here. We're soldiers, not witch doctors. You just saw him beat the guts out of the leader of a gang. He was thorough. He didn't just beat him. He beat him deep, like Mazer Rackham, at the spare me. So in the judgment of the committee, he passes. Mostly. Let's see what he does with his brother, now that the monitor's off. His brother? Aren't you afraid of what his brother will do to him? You were the one who told me that this wasn't a non-risk business. I went back through some of the tapes. I can't help it. I like the kid. I think we're going to screw him up. Of course we are. It's our job. We're the wicked witch. We promise gingerbread, but we eat the little bastards alive. I'm sorry, Ender, Valentine whispered. She was looking at the band-aid on his neck. Ender touched the wall, and the door closed behind him. I don't care. I'm glad it's gone. What's gone? Peter walked into the parlor, chewing on a mouthful of bread and peanut butter. Ender did not see Peter as the beautiful, ten-year-old boy the grown-up saw, with dark, thick, tousled hair and a face that could have belonged to Alexander the Great. Ender looked at Peter only to detect anger or boredom, the dangerous moods that almost always led to pain. Now, as Peter's eyes discovered the band-aid on his neck, the telltale flicker of anger appeared. Valentine saw it, too. Now he's like us, she said, trying to soothe him before he had time to strike. But Peter would not be soothed. Like us? He keeps the little sucker till he's six years old. When did you lose yours? You were three. I lost mine before I was five. He almost made it. Little bastard. Little bugger. This is it, all right, Ender thought. Talk and talk, Peter. Talk is fine. Well, now your guardian angels aren't watching over you, Peter said. Now they aren't checking to see if you feel pain, listening to hear what I'm saying, seeing what I'm doing to you. How about that? How about it? Ender shrugged. Suddenly, Peter smiled and clapped his hands together in a mockery of good cheer. Let's play buggers and astronauts, he said. Where's Mom? asked Valentine. Out, said Peter. I'm in charge. I think I'll call Daddy. Call away, said Peter. You know he's never in. I'll play, said Ender. You be the bugger, said Peter. Let him be the astronaut for once, Valentine said. Keep your fat face out of it, fart mouth, said Peter. Come on upstairs and choose your weapons. It would not be a good game, Ender knew. 
it was not a question of winning. When kids played in the corridors, whole troops of them, the buggers never won, and sometimes the games got mean. But here, in their flat, the game would start mean, and the bugger couldn't just go empty and quit the way the buggers did in the real wars. The bugger was in it until the astronaut decided it was over. Peter opened his bottom drawer and took out the bugger mask. Mother had got upset at him when Peter bought it, but Dad pointed out that the war wouldn't just go away because you hid a bugger mask and wouldn't let your kids play with make-believe laser guns. Better to play the war games and have a better chance of surviving when the buggers came. If I survive the games, thought Ender, he put on the mask. It closed him in like a hand pressed tight against his face. But this wasn't how it feels to be a bugger, thought Ender. You don't wear a mask like a face. It is their face. On their home worlds, do the buggers put on human masks and play? And what do they call us? Slimies, because we're soft and oily compared to them? Watch out, slimy, Ender said. He could barely see Peter through the eye holes. Peter smiled at him. Slimy, huh? Well, bugger wugger, let's see how to break that face of yours. Ender couldn't see it coming, except a slight shift of Peter's weight. The mask cut out his peripheral vision. Suddenly, there was a lot of pain and pressure of a blow on the side of his head. He lost balance, fell that way. Don't see too well, do you, bugger, said Peter. Ender began to take off the mask. Peter put his toe against Ender's groin. Don't take off the mask, Peter said. Ender pulled the mask down into place, took his hands away. Peter pressed with his foot. Pain shot through Ender, and he doubled up. Lie flat, bugger. We're going to vivisect you, bugger. At long last, we've got one of you alive, and we're going to see how you work. Peter, stop it, Ender said. Peter, stop it. Very good. So you buggers can guess our names. You can make yourself sound like pathetic, cute little children, so we'll love you and be nice to you. But it doesn't work. I can see you for what you really are. They meant you to be a human little third, but you're really a bugger, and now it shows. He lifted his foot, took a step, and then knelt on Ender, his knee pressing into Ender's belly, just below the breastbone. He put more and more of his weight on Ender. It became hard to breathe. I could kill you like this, Peter whispered. Just press and press until you're dead. And I could say that I didn't know it would hurt you, and that we were just playing, and they'd believe me, and everything would be fine, and you'd be dead. Everything would be fine. Ender could not speak. The breath was being forced from his lungs. Peter might mean it. Probably didn't mean it. But then he might. I do mean it, Peter said. Whatever you think, I mean it. They only authorized you because I was so promising, but I didn't pan out. You did better. They think you're better. But I don't want a better little brother, Ender. I don't want a third. I'll tell, Valentine said from the doorway. No one would believe you. They'd believe me. Then you're dead too, sweet little sister. Oh yes, said Valentine. They'll believe that. I didn't know it would kill Andrew, and then he was dead. And I didn't know it would kill Valentine too. The pressure let up a little. So, not today, but someday you two won't be together, and there'll be an accident. You're all talk, Valentine said. You don't mean any of it. I don't. And do you know why you don't mean it? Valentine asked. Because you want to be in government someday. You want to be elected, and they won't elect you if your opponents can dig up the fact that your brother and sister both died in suspicious accidents when they were little, especially because of the letter I've put in my secret file in the city library, which will be opened in the event of my death. Don't give me that kind of crap, Peter said. It says, I didn't die a natural death. Peter killed me. And if he hasn't already killed Andrew, he will soon. Not enough to convict you, but enough to keep you from ever getting elected. You're his monitor now, said Peter. You better watch him day and night. You better be there. Ender and I aren't stupid. We scored as well as you did on everything. Better on some things. We're all such wonderfully bright children. You're not the smartest, Peter. Just the biggest. Oh, I know, but there'll come a day when you aren't there with him, when you forget, and suddenly you'll remember, and you'll rush to him, and there he'll be, perfectly all right, and the next time you won't worry so much, and you won't come so fast, and every time he'll be all right, and you'll think that I forgot, even though you'll remember that I said this, you'll think that I forgot, and years will pass, and then there'll be a terrible accident, and I'll find his body, and I'll cry and cry over him, and you'll remember this conversation, Valley, 
but you'll be ashamed of yourself for remembering because you'll know that I changed, that it really was an accident, that it's cruel of you to even remember what I said in a childhood quarrel, except that it'll be true. I'm going to save this up, and he's going to die, and you won't do a thing. Not a thing. But you go on believing that I'm just the biggest. The biggest asshole, Valentine said. Peter leapt to his feet and started for her. She shied away. Ender pried off the mask. Peter flopped back on his bed and started to laugh, loud, but with real mirth, tears coming to his eyes. Oh, you guys are just super, just the biggest suckers on planet Earth. Now he's going to tell us it was all a joke, Valentine said. Not a joke, a game. I can make you guys believe anything. I can make you dance around like puppets. In a phony monster voice, he said, I'm going to kill you and chop you up into little pieces and put you in the garbage hole. He laughed again. Biggest suckers in the solar system. Ender stood there watching him laugh and thought of Stilson, thought of how it felt to crunch into his body. This is who needed it. This is who should have got it. As if she could read his mind, Valentine whispered, No, Ender. Peter suddenly rolled to the side, flipped off the bed, and got in position for a fight. Oh, yes, Ender, he said. Any time, Ender. Ender lifted his right leg and took off his shoe. He held it up. See there, on the toe? That's blood, Peter. It's not mine. Ooh, ooh, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. Ender squished a little caterpillar, and now he's gonna squish me. There was no getting to him. Peter was a murderer at heart, and nobody knew it but Valentine and Ender. Mother came home and commiserated with Ender about the monitor. Father came home and kept saying it was such a wonderful surprise. They had such fantastic children that the government told them to have three, and now the government didn't want to take any of them after all. So here they were with three. They still had a third, until Ender wanted to scream at him. I know I'm a third. I know it. If you want, I'll go away so you don't have to be embarrassed in front of everybody. I'm sorry I lost the monitor. Now you have three kids and no obvious explanation. So inconvenient for you. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. He lay in bed, staring upward into the darkness. On the bunk above him, he could hear Peter turning and tossing restlessly. Then Peter slid off the bunk and walked out of the room. Ender heard the hushing sound of the toilet clearing. Then Peter stood silhouetted in the doorway. He thinks I'm asleep. He's going to kill me. Peter walked to the bed, and sure enough, he did not lift himself up onto his bed. Instead, he came and stood by Ender's head. But he did not reach for the pillow to smother Ender. He did not have a weapon. He whispered, Ender, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know how it feels. I'm sorry. I'm your brother. I love you. A long time later, Peter's even breathing said that he was asleep. Ender peeled the band-aid from his neck, and for the second time that day, he cried. Chapter 3. Graph. The sister is our weak link. He really loves her. I know. She can undo it all from the start. He won't want to leave her. So what are you going to do? Persuade him that he wants to come with us more than he wants to stay with her. How will you do that? I'll lie to him. And if that doesn't work, then I'll tell the truth. We're allowed to do that in emergencies. We can't plan for everything, you know. Ender wasn't very hungry during breakfast. He kept wondering what it would be like at school, facing Stilson after yesterday's fight, what Stilson's friends would do. Probably nothing, but he couldn't be sure. He didn't want to go. You're not eating, Andrew, Mother said. Peter came into the room. Morning, Ender. Thanks for leaving your slimy washcloth in the middle of the shower. Just for you, Ender murmured. Andrew, you have to eat. Ender held out his wrists, a gesture that said, So feed it to me through a needle. Very funny, Mother said. I try to be concerned, but it makes no difference to my genius children. It was all your genes that made us geniuses, Mom, said Peter. We didn't get any from Dad. I heard that, Father said, not looking up from the news that was being displayed on the table while he ate. It would have been wasted if you hadn't. The table beeped. Someone was at the door. Who is it? Mother asked. Father thumbed a key and a man appeared on his video. He was wearing the only military uniform that meant anything anymore. The IF. The International Fleet. I thought it was over, Father said. Peter said nothing, just poured milk over his cereal. And Ender thought, maybe I won't have to go to school today after all. Father coated the door open and got up from the table. 
I'll see to it, he said. Stay and eat. They stayed, but they didn't eat. A few moments later, Father came back into the room and beckoned to Mother. You're in deep poo, said Peter. They found out what you did to that kid at school, and now they're going to make you do time out in the belt. I'm only six, moron. I'm a juvenile. You're a third, turd. You got no rights. Valentine came in, her hair in a sleepy halo around her face. Where's Mom and Dad? I'm too sick to go to school. Another oral exam, huh? Peter said. Shut up, Peter, said Valentine. You should relax and enjoy it, said Peter. It could be worse. I don't know how. It could be an anal exam. Yuck, yuck, Valentine said. Where are mother and father? Talking to the guy from IF. Instinctively, she looked at Ender. After all, for years, they had expected someone to come and tell them that Ender had passed, that Ender was needed. That's right, look at him, Peter said. But it might be me, you know. They might have realized I was the best of the lot after all. Peter's feelings were hurt, and so he was being a snot as usual. The door opened. Ender, said Father, you better come in here. Sorry, Peter, Valentine taunted. Father glowered. Children, this is no laughing matter. Ender followed Father into the parlor. The IAF officer rose to his feet when they entered, but he did not extend a hand to Ender. Mother was twisting at her wedding band on her finger. Andrew, she said, I never thought you were the kind to get in a fight. The Stilson boy is in the hospital, Father said. You really did a number on him. With your shoe, Ender. That wasn't exactly fair. Ender shook his head. He had expected someone from the school to come about Stilson, not an officer of the fleet. This was more serious than he had thought, and yet he couldn't think what else he could have done. Do you have any explanation for your behavior, young man? said the officer. Ender shook his head again. He didn't know what to say, and he was afraid to reveal himself to be any more monstrous than his actions had made him out to be. I'll take it. Whatever the punishment is, he thought, let's get it over with. We're willing to consider extenuating circumstances, the officer said, but I must tell you it doesn't look good. Kicking him in the groin, kicking him repeatedly in the face and body when he was down, it sounds like you really enjoyed it. I didn't, Ender whispered. Then why did you do it? He had his gang there, Ender said. So? This excuses anything? No. Tell me why you kept kicking him. You had already won. Knocking him down won the first fight. I wanted to win all the next ones, too, so they'd leave me alone. Ender couldn't help it. He was too afraid, too ashamed of his own acts. Though he tried not to. He cried again. Ender did not like to cry, and rarely did. Now, in less than a day, he had done it three times and each time was worse. To cry in front of his mother and father and this military man, that was shameful. You took away the monitor, Ender said. I had to take care of myself, didn't I? Ender, you should have asked a grown-up for help, father began, but the officer stood and stepped across the room to Ender. He held out his hand. My name is Graf, Ender, Colonel Hiram Graf. I'm director of primary training at Battle School in the Belt. I've come to invite you to enter the school. After all, but the monitor. The final step in your testing was to see what would happen with the monitor off. We don't always do it that way, but in your case... And he passed? Mother was incredulous, putting the Stilson boy in the hospital. What would you have done if Andrew had killed him, given him a medal? It isn't what he did, Mrs. Wigan. It's why. Colonel Graff handed her a folder full of papers. Here are the requisitions. Your son has been cleared by the IF Selective Service. Of course, we already have your consent, granted in writing at the time of conception was confirmed, or he could not have been born. He, he has been ours from then, if he qualified. Father's voice was trembling when he spoke. It's not very kind of you to let us think you didn't want him, and then take him after all. And this charade about the Stilson boy, Mother said. It wasn't a charade, Mrs. Wigan. Until we knew what Ender's motivation was, we couldn't be sure he wasn't another... We had to know what the action meant, or at least what Ender believed that it meant. Must you call him that stupid name? Mother began to cry. That's the name he calls himself. What are you going to do? Colonel Graff, Father asked. Walk out the door with him now? That depends, said Graff. On what? On whether Ender wants to come. Mother, weeping, turned to bitter laughter. Oh, so it's voluntary after all. How sweet! 
For the two of you, the choice was made when Ender was conceived. But for Ender, the choice has not been made at all. Conscripts make good cannon fodder. But for officers, we need volunteers. Officers? Ender asked at the sound of his voice. The others fell silent. Yes, said Graf. Battle school is for training future starship captains and commodores of flotillas and admirals of the fleet. Let's not have any deception here, Father said angrily. How many of the boys at the battle school actually end up in command of ships? Unfortunately, Mr. Wigan, that is classified information. But I can say that none of our boys who makes it through the first year has ever failed to receive a commission as an officer, and none has retired from a position of lower rank than chief executive officer of an interplanetary vessel. Even in the domestic defense forces within our own solar system, there's honor to be had. How many make it through their first year? Ender asked. All who want to, said Graf. Ender almost said, I want to, but he held his tongue. This would keep him out of school, but that was stupid. That was a problem for a few days. It would keep him away from Peter. That was more important. That might be a matter of life itself. But to leave mother and father, and above all, to leave Valentine and become a soldier. Ender didn't like fighting. He didn't like Peter's kind, the strong against the weak, and he didn't like his own kind either, the smart against the stupid. I think, Graf said, that Ender and I should have a private conversation. No, Father said. I won't take him without letting you speak to him again, Graf said, and you can't really stop me. Father glared at Graf for a moment, then got up and left the room. Mother paused to squeeze Ender's hand. She closed the door behind her when she left. Ender, Graf said, if you come with me, you won't be back here for a long time. There aren't any vacations from battle school, no visitors either. A full course of training lasts until you're 16 years old. You get your first leave under certain circumstances when you're 12. Believe me, Ender, people change in six years. In ten years, your sister Valentine will be a woman when you see her again. If you come with me, you'll be strangers. You'll still love her, Ender, but you won't know her. You see, I'm not pretending it's easy. Mom and Daddy? I know you, Ender. I've been watching the monitor discs for some time. You won't miss your mother and father. Not much. Not for long. And they won't miss you long, either. Tears came to Ender's eyes in spite of himself. He turned his face away, but would not reach up to wipe them. They do love you, Ender, but you have to understand what your life has cost them. They were born religious, you know. Your father was baptized with the name Jean-Paul Wixerec. Catholic, the seventh of nine children. Nine children? That was unthinkable. Criminal. Yes, well, people do strange things for religion. You know the sanctions, Ender. They were not as harsh then, but still not easy. Only the first two children had free education. Taxes steadily rose with each new child. Your father turned 16 and invoked the Non-Complying Families Act to separate himself from this family. He changed his name, renounced his religion, and vowed never to have more than the allotted two children. He meant it. All the shame and persecution he went through as a child, he vowed no child of his would go through it. Do you understand? He didn't want me. Well, no one wants a third anymore. You can't expect them to be glad, but your father and mother are a special case. They both renounce their religions. Your mother was born a Mormon, but, in fact, their feelings are still ambiguous. Do you know what ambiguous means? They feel both ways. They're ashamed of having come from non-compliant families. They conceal it to the degree that your mother refuses to admit to anyone that she was born in Utah, lest they suspect. Your father denies his Polish ancestry, since Poland is still a non-compliant nation and under international sanction because of it. So you see, having a third, even under the government's direct instruction, undoes everything they've been trying to do. I know that. But it's more complicated than that. Your father still named you with legitimate saint's names. In fact, he baptized all three of you himself as soon as he got you home after you were born, and your mother objected. They quarreled over it each time, not because she didn't want you baptized, but because she didn't want you baptized Catholic. They haven't really given up their religion. They look at you and see you as a badge of pride, because they were able to circumvent the law and have a third. But... You're also a badge of cowardice, because they dare not go further and practice the non-compliance they still feel is right. 
and you're a badge of public shame because at every step you interfere with their efforts at assimilation into normal, complying society. How can you know all this? We monitored your brother and sister, Ender. You'd be amazed how sensitive the instruments are. We were connected directly to your brain. We heard all that you heard, whether you were listening carefully or not, whether you understood or not. We understand. So my parents love me and don't love me? They love you. The question is whether they want you here. Your presence in this house is a constant disruption, a source of tension. Do you understand? I'm not the one who causes tension. Not anything you do, Ender. Your life itself. Your brother hates you because you are living proof that he wasn't good enough. Your parents resent you because of all the past that they're trying to evade. Valentine loves me with all her heart, completely, unstintingly. She's devoted to you, and you adore her. I told you it wouldn't be easy. What's it like there? Hard work. Studies. Just like school here, except we put you into mathematics and computers much more heavily. Military history, strategy, and tactics. And above all, the battle room. What's that? War games. All the boys are organized into armies. Day after day, in zero gravity, there are mock battles. Nobody gets hurt, but winning and losing matter. Everybody starts as a common soldier, taking orders. Older boys are your officers, and it's their duty to train you and command you in battle. More than that, I can't tell you. It's like playing buggers and astronauts, except that you have weapons that work and fellow soldiers fighting beside you, and your whole future and the future of the human race depends on how well you learn, how well you fight. It's a hard life, and you won't have a normal childhood. Of course, with your mind, and as a third to boot, you wouldn't have a particularly normal childhood anyway. All boys? A few girls. They don't often pass the tests to get in. Too many centuries of evolution are working against them. None of them will be like Valentine, anyway. But there'll be brothers there, Ender. Like Peter? Peter wasn't accepted, Ender, for the very reasons that you hate him. I don't hate him, I'm just... afraid of him. Well, Peter isn't all bad, you know. He was the best we'd seen in a long time. We asked your parents to choose a daughter next. They would have anyway, hoping that Valentine would be a Peter, but milder. She was too mild, and so we requisitioned you. To be half Peter and half Valentine? If things worked out right. Am I? As far as we can tell, our tests are very good, Ender, but they don't tell us everything. In fact, when it comes down to it, they hardly tell us anything, but they're better than nothing. Graf leaned over and took Ender's hand in his. Ender Wigan, if it were just a matter of choosing the best and happiest future for you, I'd tell you to stay home. Stay here, grow up, be happy. There are worse things than being a third. Worse things than a big brother who can't make up his mind whether to be a human being or a jackal. Battle school is one of those worse things, but we need you. The buggers may seem like a game to you now, Ender, but they damn near wiped us out last time. They had us cold, outnumbered, and outweaponed. The only thing that saved us was we had the most brilliant military commander we ever found. Call it fate, call it God, call it damn fool luck. We had Mazerackum. But we don't have him now, Ender. We've scraped together everything mankind could produce. A fleet that makes the one they sent against us last time seem like a bunch of kids playing in a swimming pool. We have some new weapons, too, but it might not be enough. Even so, because in the 80 years since the last war, they've had as much time to prepare as we have. We need the best we can get, and we need them fast. Maybe you're not going to work out for us, and maybe you are. Maybe you'll break down under the pressure. Maybe it'll ruin your life. Maybe you'll hate me for coming here to chew to your house today. But... If there's a chance that because you're in with the fleet, mankind might survive and the buggers might leave us alone forever, then I'm going to ask you to do it, to come with me. Ender had trouble focusing on Colonel Graf. The man looked far away and very small, as if Ender could pick him up with tweezers and drop him in a pocket, to leave everything here and go to a place that was very hard, with no valentine, no mom and dad. And then... He thought of the films of the buggers that everyone had to see at least once a year. The scathing of China, the battle of the belt, death and suffering and terror, and Mazer Rackham and his brilliant maneuvers destroying an enemy fleet twice his size and twice his firepower, using the little human ships that seemed so frail and weak, 
like children fighting with grown-ups, and we won. I'm afraid, Ender said quietly, but I'll go with you. Tell me again, said Graf. It's what I was born for, isn't it? If I don't go, why am I alive? Not good enough, said Graf. I don't want to go, said Ender, but I will. Graf nodded. You can change your mind. Up until the time you get in my car with me, you can change your mind. After that, you stay at the pleasure of the International Fleet. Do you understand that? Ender nodded. All right, let's tell them. Mother cried. Father held Ender tight. Peter shook his hand and said, You lucky little pin-headed fart-eater. Valentine kissed him and left her tears on his cheek. There was nothing to pack, no belongings to take. The school provides everything you need, from uniforms to school supplies. And as for toys, there's only one game. Goodbye, Ender said to his family, and reached up and took Colonel Graff's hand and walked out the door with him. Kill some buggers for me, Peter shouted. I love you, Andrew, Mother called. We'll write you, Father said. And as he got into the car that waited silently in the corridor, he heard Valentine's anguished cry. Come back to me. I love you forever. Chapter 4. Launch. With Ender, we have to strike a delicate balance. Isolate him enough that he remains creative. Otherwise, he'll adopt the system here and we'll lose him. At the same time, we need to make sure that he keeps a strong ability to lead. If he earns rank, he'll lead. It isn't that simple. Mesa Rackham could handle his little fleet and win. By the time this war happens, there will be too much, even for a genius. Too many little boats. He has to work smoothly with his subordinates. Oh, good. He has to be a genius and nice, too. Not nice. Nice will let the buggers have us all. So you're going to isolate him. I'll have him completely separate from the rest of the boys by the time we get to the school. I have no doubt of it. I'll be waiting for you to get here. I watched the vids of what he did to that Stilson boy. This is not a sweet little kid you're bringing up here. That's where you're mistaken. He's even sweeter than he looks. But don't worry. We will purge that in a hurry. Sometimes I think you enjoy breaking these little geniuses. There is an art to it, and I'm very, very good at it. But enjoy? Well, maybe. When they put back the pieces afterwards and it makes them better. You're a monster. Thanks. Does that mean I get a raise? Just a medal. The budget isn't inexhaustible. They say the weightlessness can cause disorientation, especially in children, whose sense of direction isn't yet secure. But Ender was disoriented before he even left Earth's gravity, before the shuttle launch even began. There were 19 other boys in his launch. They filed out of the bus and on to the elevator. They talked and joked and bragged and laughed. Ender kept his silence. He noticed how Graf and the other officers were watching them, analyzing. Everything we do means something, Ender realized. Them laughing, me not laughing. He toyed with the idea of trying to be like the other boys, but he couldn't think of any jokes, and none of theirs seemed funny. Wherever their laughter came from, Ender couldn't find such a place in himself. He was afraid, and fear made him serious. They had dressed him in a uniform, all in a single piece. It felt funny not to have a belt cinched around his waist. He felt baggy and naked dressed like that. There were TV cameras going, perched like animals on the shoulders of crouching, prowling men. The men moved slowly, cat-like, so the camera motion would be smooth. Ender caught himself moving smoothly, too. He imagined himself being on TV in an interview, the announcer asking him, How do you feel, Mr. Wigan? Actually, quite well, except hungry. Hungry? Oh, yes, they don't let you eat for 24 hours before the launch. How interesting. I never knew that. All of us are quite hungry, actually. And all the while, during the interview, Ender and the TV man would slink along smoothly in front of the cameraman, taking long, lithe strides. The TV guy was letting him be the spokesman for the boys, though Ender was barely competent to speak for himself. For the first time, Ender felt like laughing. He smiled, too, and the other boys near him were laughing at the moment, too, for another reason. They think I'm smiling at their joke, thought Ender, but I'm smiling at something much funnier. Go up the ladder, one at a time, said the officer. When you come to an aisle with empty seats, take one. There aren't any window seats. It was a joke. The other boys laughed. Ender was near the last, but not the very last. The TV cameras did not give up, though. 
Will Valentine see me disappear into the shuttle? He thought of waving at her, of running up to the cameraman and saying, Can I tell Valentine goodbye? He didn't he didn't know that it would be censored out of the tape if he did, for the boys soaring out to battle school were all supposed to be heroes. They weren't supposed to miss anybody. Ender didn't know about the censorship, but he did know that running to the cameras would be wrong. He walked the short bridge to the door in the shuttle. He noticed that the wall to his right was carpeted like a floor. That was where the disorientation began. The moment he thought of the wall as a floor, he began to feel like he was walking on a wall. He got to the ladder and noticed the vertical surface behind it was also carpeted. I'm climbing up the floor, hand over hand, step by step. And then, for fun, he pretended that he was climbing down the wall. He did it almost instantly in his mind, convinced himself against the best evidence of gravity until he reached an empty seat. He found himself gripping the seat tightly, even though gravity pulled him firmly against it. The other boys were bouncing in their seats a little poking and pushing, shouting. Ender carefully found the straps, figured out how they fit together to hold him at the crotch, waist, and shoulders. He imagined the ship dangling upside down on the underside of the earth, the giant fingers of gravity holding them firmly in place. But we will slip away, he thought. We're going to fall off this planet. He did not know its significance at the time. Later, though, he would remember that it was even before he left Earth that he first thought of it as a planet like any other, not particularly his own. Oh, already figured it out, said Graf. He was standing on the ladder. Coming with us? Ender asked. I don't usually come down for recruiting, Graf said. I'm kind of in charge up there, administrator of the school, like a principal. They told me I had to come back or I'd lose my job, he smiled. Ender smiled back. He felt comfortable with Graf. Graf was good, and he was principal of the battle school. Ender relaxed a little. He would have a friend there. Adults helped the other boys belt themselves in place, those who hadn't done as Ender did. Then they waited for an hour while a TV at the front of the shuttle introduced them to shuttle flight, the history of space flight, and their possible future with the great starships of the IF. Very boring stuff. Ender had seen such films before. Except that he had not been belted into a seat inside a shuttle, hanging upside down from the belly of the Earth. The launch wasn't very, wasn't bad. A little scary, some jolting, a few moments of panic that this might be the first failed launch since the early days of the shuttle. The movies hadn't made it plain how much violence you could experience lying on your back in a soft chair. Then it was over, and he really was hanging by the straps. No gravity anywhere. But because he had already reoriented himself, he was not surprised when Graf came up the ladder backwards, as if he were climbing down to the front of the shuttle. Nor did it bother him when Graf hooked his feet under a rung and pushed off with his hands, so that suddenly he swung upright as if he were an ordinary airplane. The reorientation were too much for some. One boy gagged. Ender understood then why they had been forbidden to eat anything for 24 hours before the launch. Vomiting in null gravity wouldn't be fun. But for Ender, Graf's gravity game was fun and he carried it further, imagining that Graf was actually hanging upside down from the center aisle, and then pictured him sticking straight out from a side wall. Gravity could go any which way, however I want it to go. I can make Graf stand on his head, and he doesn't even know it. What do you find so funny, Wigan? Graf's voice was sharp and angry. What did I do wrong, thought Ender. Did I laugh out loud? I asked you a question, soldier, barked Graf. Oh, yes. This is the beginning of the training routine. Ender had seen some military shows on TV, and they always shouted a lot at the beginning of the training before the soldiers and officers became good friends. Yes, sir, Ender said. Well, answer it then. I thought of you hanging upside down by your feet. I thought it was funny. It sounded stupid now, with Graf looking at him coldly. To you, I suppose it is funny. Is it funny to anybody else here? Murmurs of no. Well, why isn't it? Graf looked at them all with contempt. Scum brains, that's what we've got on this launch. Pin-headed little morons. Only one of you had the brains to realize that in null gravity, directions are whatever you conceive them to be. Do you understand that, shafts? The boy nodded. No, you didn't. Of course you didn't. Not only stupid, but a liar, too. There's only one boy on this launch with any brains at all, and that's Ender Wigan. Take a good look at him, boys. 
He's going to be a commander when you're still in diapers up there, because he knows how to think in null gravity, and you just want to throw up. This wasn't the way the show was supposed to go. Graf was supposed to pick on him, not set him up as the best. They were supposed to be against each other at first, so they could become friends later. Most of you are going to ice out. Get used to that, little boys. Most of you are going to end up in combat school, because you didn't have the brains to handle deep space piloting. Most of you aren't worth the price you're bringing to, of bringing you up here to battle school, because you didn't have what it takes. Some of you might make it. Some of you might be worth something to humanity, but don't bet on it. I'm betting on only one. Suddenly, Graf did a backflip and caught the ladder with his hands, then swung his feet away from the ladder doing a handstand as if the floor was down, dangling by his hands if the floor was up. Hand over hand, he swung himself back along the aisle to his seat. Looks like you've got it made here, whispered the boy next to him. Ender shook his head. Oh, won't even talk to me, the boy said. I didn't ask him to say that stuff, Ender whispered. He felt a sharp pain on the top of his head. Then again, some giggles from behind him. The boy in the next seat must have unfastened his straps. Again, a blow to the head. Go away, Ender thought. I didn't do anything to you. Again, a blow to the head. Laughter from the boys. Didn't Graf see this? Wasn't he going to stop it? Another blow. Harder. It really hurt. Where was Graf? Then it became clear. Graf had deliberately caused it. It was worse than the abuse in the shows. When the sergeant picked on you, the others liked you better. When the officer prefers you, the others hate you. Hey, fart eater, came the whisper from behind him. He was hit on the head again. Do you like this? Hey, super brain, is this fun? Another blow. This one's so hard that Ender cried out softly with the pain. If Graf, was, if Graf was setting him up, there'd be no help unless he helped himself. He waited until he thought another blow was about to come. Now, he thought, and yes, the blow was there. It hurt, but Ender was already trying to sense the coming of the next blow. Now, and yes, right on time. I've got you, Ender thought. Just as the next blow was coming... Ender reached up with both hands, snatched the boy by the wrist, and then pulled down on him hard. In gravity, the boy would have been jammed against Ender's back seat, hurting his chest. In null gravity, however, he flipped over the seat completely, up towards the ceiling. Ender wasn't expecting it. He hadn't realized how null gravity magnified the effects of even a child's movements. The boy sailed through the air, bounced against the ceiling, then down against another boy in his seat, then out into the aisle, his arms flailing until he screamed as his body slammed into the bulkhead at the front of the compartment, his left arm twisted under him. It only took seconds. Graf was already there, snatching the boy out of the air. Deftly, he propelled him down the aisle toward the other man. Left arm, broken, I think, he said. In moments, the boy had been given a drug and lay quietly in the chair as the officer ballooned a splint around his arm. Ender felt sick. He had only meant to catch the boy's arm. No. No, he had meant to hurt him, and had pulled with all his strength. He hadn't meant it to be so public, but the boy was feeling exactly the pain Ender had meant him to feel. No gravity had betrayed him, that was all. I am Peter. I'm just like him. And Ender hated himself. Graft stayed at the front of the cabin. What are you, slow learners? In your feeble little minds, haven't you picked up one little fact? You were brought here to be soldiers. In your old schools, in your old families, maybe you were the big shot. Maybe you were tough. Maybe you were smart. But we chose the best of the best, and that's the only kind of kid you're going to meet now. And when I tell you Ender Wigan is the best in this launch, take the hint, my little dorklings. Don't mess with them. Little boys have died in battle school before. Do I make myself clear? There was silence the rest of the launch. The boy sitting next to Ender was scrupulously careful not to touch him. I am not a killer, Ender said to himself over and over. I am not Peter, no matter what Graf says. I'm not. I was defending myself. I bore it a long time. I was patient. I'm not what he said. A voice over the speaker told them they were approaching the school. It took twenty minutes to decelerate and dock. Ender lagged behind the others. They were not unwilling to let him be the last to leave the shuttle, climbing upward in the direction that had been down when they embarked. Graf was waiting at the end of the narrow tube that led from the shuttle into the heart of battle school. Was it a good flight, Ender? 
Graf asked cheerfully. I thought you were my friend, despite himself, Ender's voice trembled. Graf looked puzzled. Whatever gave you that idea, Ender? Because you... Because you spoke nicely to me, and honestly, you didn't lie. I won't lie now either, said Graf. My job isn't to be friends. My job is to produce the best soldiers in the world, in the whole history of the world. We need a Napoleon, an Alexander, except that Napoleon lost in the end, and Alexander flamed out and died young. We need a Julius Caesar, except that he made himself a dictator and died for it. My job is to produce such a creature and all the men and women he'll need to help him. Nowhere in that does it say I have to make friends with children. You made them hate me. So, what will you do about it? Crawl into a corner? Start kissing their little backsides so they'll love you again? There's only one thing that will make them stop hating you, and that's being so good at what you do that they can't ignore you. I told them you were the best. Now you damn well better be. What if I can't? Then too bad. Look, Ender, I'm sorry if you're lonely and afraid, but the buggers are out there. Ten billion, a hundred billion, a million billion of them, for all we know. With as many ships, for all we know, with weapons we can't understand, and a willingness to use those weapons to wipe us out. It isn't the world at stake, Ender. Just us. Just humankind. As far as the rest of the biosphere is concerned, we could be wiped out and it would adjust. It would get on with the next step in evolution. But humanity doesn't want to die. As a species, we've evolved to survive. And the way we do it is by straining and straining. And, at last, every few generations giving birth to genius. The one who invents the wheel, the light and flight. The one who builds a city, a nation, an empire. Do you understand any of this? Ender thought he did, but he wasn't sure, so he said nothing. No, of course not. So I'll put it bluntly. Human beings are free except when humanity needs them. Maybe humanity needs you to do something. Maybe humanity needs me to find out what you're good for. We might both do despicable things, Ender, but if humankind survives, then we were good tools. Is that all? Just tools? Individual human beings are all tools that the others use to help us all survive. That's a lie. No, just a half-truth. You can worry about the other half after we win this war. It'll be over before I grow up, Ender said. I hope you're wrong, said Graf. By the way, you aren't helping yourself at all talking to me. The other boys are no doubt telling each other that old Ender Wiggin is back there licking up to Graf. If word once gets around that you're a teacher's boy, you're iced for sure. In other words, go away and leave me alone. Goodbye, Ender said. He pulled himself hand over hand along the tube where the other boys had gone. Graf watched him go. One of the teachers near him said, Is that the one? God knows, said Graf. If Ender isn't him, then he better show up soon. Maybe it's nobody, said the teacher. Maybe, but if that's the case, Anderson, then in my opinion, God is a bugger. You can quote me on that. I will. They stood in silence a while longer. Anderson? Hmm? The kid's wrong. I am his friend. I know. He's clean, right to the heart. He's good. I've read the reports. Anderson, think what we're going to do to him. Anderson was defiant. We're going to make him the best military commander in history. And then put the fate of the world on his shoulders. For his sake, I hope it isn't him. I do. Cheer up. The buggers may kill us all before he graduates. Graf smiled. You're right. I feel better already. Thank you for listening to part one of Ender's Game, read by the Northern Narrator. If you enjoyed, please like this video, consider subscribing so you don't miss out on part two, and leave a comment below with other books you'd like me to read.